Right, good afternoon, everybody. I have some more exams here if uh, you want to come and get them afterwards or maybe during. It's okay with me. So here's a little uh, story before we start. Remember last time we talked about this wonderful book by, Sid, what was his name, Mukherjee, Siddhartha Mukherjee on uh, the, the Emperor of All Maladies, right? So Mukherjee is a professor up at the medical center. He's an oncologist. He takes care of patients with cancer, and he also does research. So I was sitting next to his department head, uh, I don't know, a year and a half ago, and he had just gotten the, the appeal at surprise for that book. And so I said to this, this person, it was Ricardo de la Favera, I remember. He used to be head of the cancer center. I said, that's pretty cool that uh, Siddhartha got a Pulitzer Prize. He said, yeah, but now he needs to get a grant. <laughs> so the realities of medical centers, Pulitzers are great, but they don't pay for the, for the research. So today we're going to talk about vaccines. Uh, for the next two lectures, the plan is to talk about how to prevent infections. And the strategies are going to be different. Today we're going to try and prevent, and you're going to when you have a lot of time. And t next week we'll talk about not next time Wednesday we'll talk about antivirals, where people get infected but you don't have a lot of time and uh, you want to treat them. So vaccines are great because they prevent us from getting infected from all these viruses. That uh, sorry, vaccines are not what does this. Our immune system is what does this. We are continually assaulted by viruses and our immune system keeps them in check. And it's been sort of a theme that we have been talking about in this course. And if, if um, we can't predict what's going to be infecting us, we use vaccines to try and take care of that. Our best defense uh, against infection are vaccines. And this is a really nice uh, graph that I like to show. Those of you who took immunology last year will remember this, or probably maybe not, which is good. Uh, this is a graph of life expectancy on the y-axis uh, with years, starting at 1900 through to 2000. And there are two curves here. The orange one is female, and the purple one is male. And you can see the life expectancy has gone from 50 years in 1900 to, for women, about 80 years now, and men about 75. And you see there's a really precipitous spike around 1918. What was that? That was the flu, the 1918 Spanish flu. It really decreased life expectancy. This increase is due to a number of things all related to medicine, of course. Public health measures, antibiotics, but also vaccines has really helped to us to live longer. So vaccines engage our immune system uh, to somehow mimic a natural infection or do something similar to a natural infection so that we don't get infected. And the, the vaccination breaks transmission of viruses in a population. So when you immunize a good fraction of the population, you can stop transmission of infection. And not everyone has to be infected, as you will see. Uh, the way they work is to stimulate an immune response. Uh, so this is a typical time course of an immune response, an adaptive immune response with infection. And these are antibodies and effector T cells on the, on the y-axis there. And you get infected, and within 7 to 14 days, you make an adaptive response. You make B cells that make antibody, and you make T cells. And of course, early on, you have this wonderful innate response that kicks in and helps to do that. Uh, the, um, the line here is basically, the red line is the amount of antibody and T cells. So this peaks at a certain point, uh, and then if your infection is cleared, the response goes down to a basal, very low level. So you, you can have antibodies against the virus for many years, but they're very, very low titers. Uh, but of course, what remains during this period are memory cells, memory B and T cells, so that when you are maybe a year or two later challenged again with the same virus or a similar virus, you have a very rapid uh, response in terms of immuno immunological responses, antibodies and T cells. And that will prevent the reinfection, as long as the virus is similar enough. Some viruses get around this, as we will see today and, and uh, later on in the course. So vaccines try and, and mimic this. They give us some memory. Now, there's a very nice experiment that was done uh, a long time ago on a remote set of islands to the north of the UK. 
which is a natural uh, experiment to demonstrate immune memory. And these are the Faroe Islands, which in the 1700s were very isolated. Only when ships came did people visit the island. There was an outbreak of measles in 1781 on these islands. Uh, for the next 65 years, there was no measles on the island. No one, the, the virus was not imported by any ship. In 1846, there was another outbreak, presumably brought there by someone on a vessel. None of the individuals who survived the 1781 epidemic uh, were infected at that point. And this was done by an epidemiologist who went and studied the cases, the, the medical histories on the island, and he said, well, this is memory against uh, infection. So yeah, they got infected in 1781, and they were protected all these years. So that's, that's immune memory. And a key concept from this experiment is that it lasts a long time without the virus being around. So on the Faroe Islands, as far as we could tell, there was no measles uh, in the intervening period between 1781 and 1846. Many people feel that memory requires constant antigen stimulation. There is a lot of debate about this in the field. Mem memory is a very interesting field of immunology, and uh, what regulates it is really being starting to be understood. I think this shows that you don't necessarily need uh, antigen stimulation to get memory. So immune memory, of course, just comprises T and B lymphocytes that remain after infection at very low levels that are specific for the pathogen that make the right antibodies or that will recognize, that in case of T cells, the right antigens being displayed in MHC molecule. And these allow you to respond very quickly and, and with high titers without having to wait after that infection. And that's what we try and do with vaccines. We try and mimic what would happen in a natural infection and provide uh, memory. So the first vaccine that we actually uh, know about in the literature was the one devised by Edward Jenner uh, in 1796 in England. Uh, so Jenner, of course, uh, made the observation that milkmaids who milked cows never got smallpox. Smallpox was a big problem in this era, and um, it was 30% lethal, so it was not a good infection to have. Cows had a disease called cowpox, and the milkmaids would get it, but it would only give them a rash on their hands where they pulled the teats of the cow. And he made this great observation. This is, this is a, a really smart physician. He was just a local physician, but he was looking, and he said, ah, there's something going on here. Maybe there's an agent um, that's involved somehow. And, and so he said, maybe uh, we should take whatever is in these lesions uh, on the cow and, and give it to people and see if it prevents smallpox. So he had a young boy as his first clinical trial. He gave, he, he put a little bit of the uh, cowpox pustule into the boy's skin and the boy never got uh, smallpox. And so that was the first vaccine. And many years later, um, Pasteur had coined the term vaccination in honor of Jenner, who had used cows, for which the name in Latin is vaca, so vaccine. And uh, that's when Pasteur made his rabies vaccine. He called it a vaccine because of Jenner. And here is how the smallpox vaccine was given in modern times. It is, since the virus has uh, tropism for the layers of the skin, um, it's, it's placed into a needle. It's called a bifurcated needle. And there's a little drop of vaccine uh, right in the needle. And then you scrape it into the skin. It replicates very well. And uh, you get immunized. And we, when I was a kid, I had this vaccine. You get it in your, your shoulder right here. So those of us of a certain age will still have the scar uh, from our vaccinations, Dr. Silverstein and myself. There we go. And, uh, but none of you have been vaccinated because we stopped doing this in 1979 when smallpox was eradicated. Twenty seconds. Okay. Uh, then, of course, we have now many other vaccines. The earlier ones were yellow fever vaccine and flu vaccine in the early uh, 1900s. I like this picture because it's an illustration of uh, the, the Janarian vaccination. This was from the 1700s. The cowpox or the wonderful effects of the new inoculation. Publication of the Anti-Vaccine Society. So I told you, you know, the, the Cutter incident was the beginning of the anti-vaccine movement in a big way, but here it actually existed already in 1789. These are people who said if you got the cowpox vaccine, you were going to grow par uh, cow parts out of where the vaccine was put in. So don't get it. 
This guy's growing one. I don't know why it's on his nose, because he didn't get immunized there. Anyway, that's pretty funny. Uh, so now we do large-scale immunization campaigns, and these work. Top one is polio. We'll talk a little bit about this in some detail. Uh, polio was a big deal in the U.S. Uh, from the early 1900s through the 50s and 60s, and two vaccines were administered in massive quantities to the population, and this has eliminated polio from the U.S. and many other countries. We'll talk about that in some detail. It's a very interesting story. And measles vaccine as well. There are many measles cases in the U.S. before the vaccine it was introduced in the, in the late 60s. Got rid of most measles. And also that uh, SSPE, subacute sclerosing panencephalitis, this late complication of measles uh, went away as well. But as I said, it's not gone from the U.S. because a lot of people still don't get immunized. And hence we have measles here in the U.S. So right now in the U.S. and many other countries, vaccines are an integral part of our public health program. You go to physicians and you get immunized according to a schedule. So children and even adults, there are some adult-specific vaccines. Uh, and your pets get vaccinated for certain diseases, as do domestic animals. Swine get Im immunized against certain kinds of influenza, et cetera. And as a consequence, all the childhood diseases are rare. Uh, when I was a kid, everybody got chickenpox and mumps and measles, et cetera. You know, you could go through them one by one, and now that doesn't happen anymore. So they're a big part of our public health, but not in the third world yet because of cost and distribution issues and, men, and politics and cultural differences. They are not yet part of that. So here are two critical concepts about how uh, vaccines work. We have to maintain a critical level of immunity. If you only give a vaccine to 10% of the population, it's not gonna have any effect because the 90% are susceptible, you will still get outbreaks. I mean, those 10% are protected, but that's not what we try and do in public health campaigns. We try and protect everyone. So you have to have enough people to be immune. And that is embodied in this second concept, which is herd immunity. Now, I've, been, I've lectured to medical students, and when I say herd immunity, they all start mooing. <laughs> so I'm glad that you didn't do that. It shows a higher level of maturity. <laughs> but herd immunity has nothing to do with cows. It has to do with the concept that when, you don't need to immunize everyone to protect the population. It doesn't mean that if I immunize one of you and then you, you shed virus and it immunizes someone else. That's a common misconception about herd immunity. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with the idea that you only need to immunize a certain fraction of the population and that stops virus spread. Thanks for the light, by the way. You gonna stay for the lecture? It's good. <laughs> yeah, good. Okay, so herd immunity. Um, so again, virus spread stops when the probability of infection drops below a certain threshold. And that's different for each virus, and it really is also different for different populations because we're all, we all differ in many ways. So here are just two examples. Smallpox, if you get 80 to 85 percent of the population immune by immunization, you will stop the spread of the virus. Measles requires a higher number, and this is probably in part because the, the uh, well, the, this, the ability of each virus to spread is different. Measles is very contagious. Now, the key here is that no vaccine is 100% effective. So if you give it to all people, if you could ever do that, which we can never do, uh, give it to 100% of the people, you would not have 100% of the people immune or have sufficient antibody or whatever the, the immune correlate is to protect them. And for example, if you get 80% of the population immunized with measles, that is, you inject the vaccine into 80% of the population. Only 76% uh, percent will be immune and resistant to infection. And this is even worse for influenza virus. It's about 60% effective, depending on, on the population. Uh, a big problem with immunization in countries like ours, developed countries with good health infrastructure, is complacency. Uh, and old People can come up with all sorts of excuses uh, for not getting immunized, like these. Viral diseases are a thing of the past. Polio is long gone. I, the third one is good. I never get the flu. You know, wherever I travel, I ask people, do you get flu vaccines? No, I haven't had it in 10 years. I haven't had the flu in 10 years, so I don't need to get the flu vaccine. Kids should get infected naturally. Yeah, what if there's a 30% fatality rate? 
associated with whatever infection. I know a guy who got the flu shot and then got the flu. How could that happen, do you think? How could that happen? Could be a different strain. Sorry? Could be already infected. Another one? There's one more possible. No, that's, this guy is using that as an excuse not to take the vaccine, but that, that usually doesn't happen um, because one of the vaccines is inactivated, so that won't happen. And the other one, which is infectious, has never been known to do that. You, it takes about two weeks to get a robust defense built up from the vaccine, right? So in that time, you could be infected. And this happens a lot because when flu season hits, everyone runs to get immunized, but the virus is circulating. So. Uh, that happens, and that, people use that as an excuse not to get the vaccine. I don't have time this year. So Dr. Silverstein uses that excuse. Wait, wait, wait. that's your excuse. <laughs> no, no, no. Me? What? I would never do something like that. I have to practice what I preach. All right, so uh, when, these, when people feel this way, and we feel this way in the U.S., this happens all the time, then we have a problem with large-scale vaccination programs. So how do you make a vaccine? We're going to talk about this today in some detail, and I'm going to give you some general principles and some specific examples about how to do that. Um, you have to make a good immune response, and it has to sometimes be balanced. Remember, we talked about the Th1 versus the Th2 response, whether antibodies or T cells predominate. We're, we're beginning to realize now this is really important. All the low-hanging fruit in terms of vaccines is done. You know, in the old days, people took influenza and polio and measles and they just made a vaccine and put it into people and it protected them. They were really lucky because it turns out that for them antibodies is probably really important. But now we're realizing that for the tougher vaccines, for the tougher viruses, this is not simple. So the gold standard when you make it is a person who is immunized has to be protected against the disease caused by a virulent form of, of the pathogen. So you get immunized against polio, you're going to be protected against poliomyelitis. It seems obvious, but it's important. If you can't protect against the disease, it's no good. Just getting a response is not enough. And let me tell you a story. I was in the uh, UK a couple of weeks ago, and I was talking to a fellow who runs vaccines for Sanofi Pester, one of the biggest, I think the biggest vaccine producer in the world. And he said they're just making a dengue vaccine. And what they did is they took yellow fever vaccine, which has been around since the early 1900s, and they substituted the glycoprotein gene with that of dengue. And there are four serotypes of dengue, remember? And um, so you need to immunize people against all four serotypes. So they did a, a trial, I think, in Thailand where they immunized people. And then after immunization, they take blood and they check for antibodies. And they all had good antibodies against all four serotypes. And then because there was an outbreak of dengue at the same time, they were able to look at efficacy. It wasn't planned to do that, but they happened to be able to collect the data. And there was good protection for type 1, type 3, and type 4 but not type 2. I mean, they, they all made antibodies against type 2 as well as the other types, but it wasn't protective. So that's the thing that get, just getting a response isn't enough. You have to show protection. In that case, we have no idea why antibodies against just type 2 would not be protective. I mean, I think a serotype, one versus the other, is going to be basically the same. So figuring that out is, uh, is going to be really interesting. Vaccines can be active or passive. Most of the vaccines we use today are active vaccines. Um, you put in a modified form of the pathogen, and that gives you immunity. Uh, passive, you're putting in immune response products like antibodies or immune cells, rabies, uh, passively administered antibodies is a good example of that. This is only good for short-term protection, but if you're bitten by a rabid animal, you do have some time to be immunized, but you will also immediately get rabies immune globulin. And this can be purchased. Companies make it. Uh, and here's a one by Canot. It's made in Lyon, France, so it must be good. Right? And uh, this is just basically uh, antibodies from people who have been immunized uh, with the rabies vaccine. They are pooled, and they're tested, of course, to make sure there are no other pathogens in it. Uh, the titer is determined, and then this is given to people who have been exposed to an animal known or thought to have rabies. This is called post-exposure prophylaxis. So if you've never gotten the rabies vaccine, you get this, and then at the same time you get rabies vaccine as well. The virus moves so slowly from the bite site to the CNS that you have time to actually immunize and be protected. 
Uh, of course, when we are born or when we're gestating and, and uh, after birth, this is a natural passive vaccine. Uh, these are antibody levels uh, graphed as a fraction of the adult level uh, during conception, birth, uh, and adult years. And so you can see uh, in, a, in a developing fetus, the antibody levels uh, begin to rise. Um, this is passively transferred maternal IgG, which begins to cross over uh, from the placenta. And it peaks at birth and then begins to go down. And then the other antibodies, the IgM, IgG, and IgA. So the IgM also begins to rise at birth. But you can see uh, these, this is IgG that the baby is producing itself. And this takes uh, you know, six to nine months to come up. So initially, the baby is protected by the immunological experience of the mother. If the mother's had a lot of infections, then she will pass on those antibodies to the baby. And then the baby will be protected until it can develop its own immune system. And so this is a natural, natural passive vaccine. So some really important requirements when you make a vaccine, it has to be safe, it can't cause disease. And that's of course a good way to get people not to take it, which was what happened with the, po the first polio vaccine. It's gotta give, give you protective immunity and again, that you don't have to immunize everyone. And you learn early on what the fraction have to, has to be uh, when herd immunity kicks in. The protection should be long lasting. It would really be nice if you didn't need to immunize more than once every five or 10 years. There are some vaccines that are that good. Uh, polio vaccine, for example, you can get once in your lifetime. You get a couple of boosters, but it will last you your entire lifetime. Uh, but there are other vaccines that you have to get every year, yes? Not specifically, but uh, part, of the, part of it, I think, is whether it's an inactivated or an infectious vaccine. So the polio vaccines are <coughs> infectious and they give you lifelong protection. The flu vaccines are inactivated and they don't. But a further complication is that viruses vary. Some viruses vary antigenically, like influenza, and you have to get a, vaccine, a new vaccine whenever the virus varies. <coughs> vaccines should also be cheap. According to WHO, if they, can use these, if they are able to use these vaccines in their programs to, de to hit developing countries, they have to be less than a dollar. Uh, so the current Sabin va polio vaccine, which is used, costs about five cents a dose. So this is a really good uh, price point. And we're thinking of changing to an inactivated vaccine, which is not, o not only harder to administer, it has to be injected, but it costs over a dollar per dose. So WHO is not very happy about that. But if you make a lot of something, you can bring down the price. Genetic stability is important. We're gonna look at this in terms of the polio vaccine. For infectious vaccines, this is not inactivated vaccines, but infectious ones, the viruses have to be genetically stable. They were selected initially to not cause disease, and those mutations that give that property cannot go away. But unfortunately, they do with polio, as you will see. Storing is an issue. So right now, all the polio vaccines have to be frozen. And it would be really nice if you didn't have to do that. There are some new tech ways of doing this. There are some ways to prepare vaccines in sugar solutions. They're dried in sugar. You can heat them for 60 degrees for three weeks, and they're still infectious. 60 degrees centigrade, not Fahrenheit, OK? And, and these, are, these are papers that have come out describing this process, which are going to be applied to vaccines uh, very quickly. And delivery is really important. Um, a needle is a problem. People don't like needles. They're expensive. Uh, you have to use disposable ones. Otherwise, you're going to spread diseases. And you need trained health care personnel to use them. Not anyone can just pick up a needle and start immunizing people. Uh, so that costs more money. Oral vaccines are great. You just drink them. It doesn't take any, any kind of training to do that. Uh, vaccines that you spray in the nose are pretty low tech as well. Uh, a, a cool new one that's coming up, and we'll talk about this a bit later, are microneedle patches that you just put on the skin with a Band-Aid, and they deliver the vaccine. So this is changing uh, as the technology develops. So today I want to talk about a couple of different ways of making vaccines and give you some specific examples. All of them start with a virus that causes some disease. You identify a need uh, to immunize, so HIV and dengue and rotaviruses, noroviruses, et cetera. You know they cause a lot of disease. You want to make a vaccine. 
And these are the ways we can do it. We can attenuate the virulence of the vaccines, so you know viruses have, have virulence that can be quantified in certain ways. We can reduce that in, in genetic ways, and there we make what's called a live natural virus vaccine. Uh, I don't like the term live, because as you know, I don't believe virus particles are actually live, but this is stuck in the literature, so uh, that's what we're stuck with saying here. We can also inactivate the infectivity of the virus. We can take the virus, treat it with some chemicals, and it's no longer infectious, but it is immunogenic, and when we inject it, it gives rise uh, to antibodies. Then we have uh, subunit vaccines, where you take the parental virus and you break it up with various detergents and chemicals. Uh, this can be purified somewhat or, or slightly purified, doesn't matter. And the flu vaccines are examples of those. We'll talk about those. And then we have vaccines all enabled by recombinant DNA technology, which of course developed in the 70s, allows you to take a gene as a piece of DNA and propagate it in a bacterial plasmid, shown here. And so you could put the gene for the protective immunogen in a, in a different virus. So you could make an adenovirus carrying HIV genes that are important for protection, for example. Uh, there are also ways where you can inject the plasmid DNA directly into the muscle. These are called DNA vaccines. Uh, and these get expressed very well in antigen-presenting cells and produce a certain kind of immunity. They're being used in some of the HIV vaccine trials. And finally, you can take uh, the viral genes cloned in vectors and express them in different kinds of cells. Uh, you can make subunit vaccines of the individual proteins, very similar to this subunit vaccine here, except that in this case, it's derived from a recombinant form of the clone gene, if you will. And sometimes when you express capsid proteins, they assemble into empty capsids. So you can make virus-like particle vaccines. So we're going to talk about examples of uh, all of these today. Uh, so here's a list of vaccines that we have available uh, to us here in the US. There are probably a few missing, but most of them are here. And some of them are not given to everyone. So there's an adenovirus vaccine that's only given to the military uh, because they tend to get, inf when they go to boot camp, they tend to all get infected with adenoviruses. So that prevents that, but it's not used for the general population. Hepatitis A, if you travel to regions where it's endemic, you would get that vaccine, but we don't give it to everyone. And then some of these should be familiar. The Hep B vaccine we'll talk about is a virus-like particle vaccine. Flu vaccine we will talk about. Again, Japanese encephalitis vaccine is only for travelers uh, to certain high-risk areas. Measles, mumps, and rubella vaccines. The papilloma vaccines, rotaviruses, polio, of course. Rabies, smallpox, uh, varicella to prevent chickenpox, and then varicella zoster, uh, folks of my age and older get this to prevent the reactivation of varicella to give you uh, shingles. You have this vaccine, Saul? Did you take it? It didn't work. You got shingles? Okay. Why didn't it work? Is it a bad vaccine? Um, it's very hard to get a high enough titer. Okay. So it's effective for preventing chicken pox, but it's not, it's not as efficacious as And then yellow fever, if you're traveling to areas where infection is common. I went to Brazil a couple of years ago. I was like, I was going to be 10 miles from the rainforest. They said you should get a yellow fever vaccine. And they also said I should get a hep A vaccine. And, um, so I went to a travel physician. This is like a new area of medicine because people travel a lot now. And I said, well, what's the course of a hep A? He said, well, three injections, three months apart. You know, I was going the next month. I said, what's the point of that? So there's a case where I said, there's no point in getting a, a hep A vaccine. All right, let's talk about inactivated vaccines. You take a virus and then you make it non-infectious. And typically you use a chemical, formalin, uh, uh, propiolactone, uh, non-ionic detergents. These are things that have been figured out over the years to empirically make the vaccine, uh, make the virus not infectious. We inf eliminate infectivity, but you don't compromise antigenicity. When you inject people with these particles, they still make an antibody response that protects them. And that's something, of course, you have to figure out by clinical trials. It's an empirical thing. So let's talk about one example of this. I think two. Polio is the first. Uh, polio, of course, causes poliomyelitis, which is an inflammation uh, of the gray matter. The name, at least, means that. It's in, from a 1959 textbook, common acute viral disease uh, characterized by a brief febrile illness, sore throat, headache, and vomiting, and in case, some cases, lower 
neuron paralysis develops. In about one in a hundred individuals, you get paralysis, and uh, as a consequence, uh, this vaccine was developed. And starting in the 1900s in the U.S., the incidence of polio rose till there were 20 to 30,000 cases a year just in the U.S. of paralytic disease. And so hospitals were full of iron lungs uh, because often the, the, the uh, muscles innervate, uh, innervated by certain nerves that ran your respiratory system were paralyzed. So these, these iron lungs would breathe for you and you would lie in them. And eventually you could get out. Most people recovered, although there were some individuals that remained in them uh, the rest of their lives. And of course, we don't have any of these anymore. You can go to museums and find them. I was in a museum in Munich last year, and they had one of them. Uh, FDR had polio, and uh, as a consequence, he started the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis and raised money, and his money kick-started making uh, the polio vaccines, the two that we have today. Polio, of course, is a non-enveloped icosahedral virus with uh, an RNA genome. So the first vaccine was, is called IPV, inactivated polio vaccine. It was developed by uh, Jonas Salk, and it's, he, he treated polio with formalin to destroy the infectivity. And he did a clinical trial in 1954. This is the largest clinical trial ever done in the U.S., 1.8 million children. Half of them got the vaccine, half of them got a control. It was a blinded trial, so no one knew uh, who was getting what. And this was, uh, these results were announced in, in April of 55, and um, oh, that was just a couple of days ago. We had the anniversary. I missed it. <laughs> it was 50 years ago, not too long ago. Um, and, and the vaccine showed 50% protection, which isn't great, but polio was a big deal back then. So the vaccine was licensed right away. Um, big headlines in the newspapers here in New York City. Salk's vaccine works. Polio vaccine is safe. Front page is pretty neat. Um, so people were really excited about this. Um, and one of the things that happened um, right after the vaccine was licensed is that kids who got it started getting polio. So what was done is all the companies that were involved, there were five or six companies who were making this, they stockpiled vaccine, and then as soon as it was approved, they released it. And so very shortly after releasing this vaccine, polio appeared in some of the kids that got it. And in the end, it turned out there were 260 cases of polio in, in 94 kids who were immunized, and then 166 contacts. So they got immunized, and then they spread the virus to others. And there were, um, I think, 70 deaths out of this incident. And it happened because Cutter Laboratories didn't follow the protocol. You know, they had, they had gotten a sheet from Jonas Salk on how to treat the virus with formaldehyde, and they didn't follow it correctly. And so there was some infectious virus present in the vaccine, and that um, paralyzed the kids. So Cutter Labs, they make insect repellent now. They don't make any. Vaccines, nobody trusts them, I guess, to make vaccine anymore. Now, this was a very interesting story, though. It was uh, the beginning of the anti real anti-vax movement because it was a lawsuit involving this, got a lot of attention. And, you know, these parents had gone to bring their kids to get immunized because they were scared of polio. And you bring your kid, and then your kid gets paralyzed. So this was a big deal, really interesting story. Uh, this vaccine was used from uh, 55 through 60 in the U.S., and it broke polio down substantially. And there's a really good book about this by Paul Offit, who is a pediatrician down at UPenn. He developed one of the rotavirus vaccines called the Cutter Incident, How America's First Polio Vaccine Led to the Growing Vaccine Crisis. Really good. I recommend it highly. All right, so um, there were many people who felt that, uh, well, this is the, the effect of the polio vaccine on the incidence of polio in the US. You can see it dropped precipitously. Uh, we switch to an oral vaccine later. We'll talk about that in a moment. But the way this vaccine works, you, you're injected intramuscularly with the vaccine. You make antibodies. And then if you ever get challenged by a wild polio virus, the virus you ingested, of course, it would replicate in your gut. And then once it gets in your blood, then it would encounter antibodies. So you could actually be replicating quite a bit of virus before it stopped. Because your gut is not immune by getting this intramuscular infection. And so people with IPV can still spread virus from one to another because it replicates in their guts. 
Another inf inactivated vaccine is the flu vaccine. This should look very familiar to you. This is an envelope virus with two glycoproteins in the envelope. And, and, and there are three types of influenza A, B, and C, and that is determined in part by uh, the glycoproteins and the internal proteins. Now, we make, an, we make a flu vaccine in this country. There are two kinds. One is an inactivated vaccine. We make it because it can cause a lot of deaths in the U.S., 3,000 to, 3, to 49,000 deaths each year. This is a 30-year uh, span, okay? Some years it's 3,000, some years it's higher. So we make a vaccine. One of them is grown in eggs, embryonated chicken eggs. It's then taken out and inactivated with formalin or disrupted. We also now have a vaccine produced in cell culture, which is just starting in the U.S., but the quantities are very low, so the vast majority of flu vaccine is egg grown still in the US. We make uh, a lot of doses every year and uh, one egg is about one dose uh, of vaccine so that's a lot of eggs. And this is supposedly, supposedly 60 to 90 percent uh, effective in, in children and adults. This high number has been questioned. It's probably more like uh, 60 percent effective. This season in fact there was a good match between the vaccine and the circulating strains and it was only about 60% effective. But we never get more than 40% of the population in the U.S. immunized with flu vaccine. Most people don't want to get immunized. They feel it's not a serious enough to disease. But I don't know. If you're one of these individuals, it's serious, right? So I don't think it's worth taking the chance. Uh, the antibodies that protect you are directed against the surface glycoproteins, the HA uh, and the NA, those glycoproteins there. Now the problem with the flu vaccine is that you have to reformulate it sometimes every year because the viruses as they circulate in populations, they infect so many people, they mutate extensively, they undergo antigenic variation, and the envelope proteins change. So at the beginning of each year, the WHO gets together with a bunch of experts. They have been collecting flu strains all over the globe for the previous year, and they decide what the next year's strain is going to be. So here in, the U in temperate zones like the, the U.S., the flu season starts in roughly November-ish, and then uh, in January they have to make a decision which strains to put in that vaccine because it takes all those months to get it out. They get the vaccine ready by August and start, start immunizing people at the local CVS. Um, and what you do is you pick strains and then you make reassortants with strains that grow well in eggs because most clinical isolates, which, are, which the vaccines are based on, they don't grow well in eggs. So you have to make reassortants with, with viruses that are known to grow well in eggs, and then you just keep the, the reassortants that express the surface glycoproteins from the circulating strains. So if you've gotten the vaccine this year and you want to know what's in it, uh, this is what's in it. It's a trivalent vaccine with an H1N1 strain, and this is the new pandemic strain that arose in 2009. This has not changed. This is the same a type that's been used since then. Then we have an H3N2 strain. This is a victorious, means it's been isolated from Australia. And then a, a B strain, uh, which is from Wisconsin. So there are three types of flu, A, B, and C, and we immunize against A and B because those cause uh, the serious disease. And now in subunit vaccines, you can either break up a virus and purify the components. So some of the flu vaccines are in fact made like this. They're broken with detergents and somewhat purified, or you can express a gene uh, by recombinant DNA. And when you do this, it's either a capsid protein or a membrane protein that you are uh, expressing. Um, subunit vaccines are, can be good and they can be bad. Some of the pros and cons, uh, if you use recombinant DNA technology, there's no infectious virus present to pose a risk. And so there's no contamination. Um, but they can be expensive. They take a lot of development to bring to market. Uh, they can be poorly antigenic. Um, they don't infect you, so they don't stimulate a good adaptive response. There's not a lot of inflammation. And they typically make antibody, not T cells, which may be important for some virus infections. And for the most part, these are delivered by injection. So they, they, we put them in the muscles so they will be picked up by antigen-presenting cells. And typically, you can't take these by spraying them in the nose or by ingesting them. So they have to be injected, which, as I said before, isn't great. And as I said, these subunit vaccines, you take the HA protein of a virus and you express it, they're not going to replicate. There's no genetic information there. So there's no inflammation. Uh, there's no danger signal. 
sent out to the immune system. Remember, the innate system likes to sense inflammation, create inflammation to get a good adaptive response. We talked about that a bit. An example of this problem is a respiratory syncytial virus vaccine. Now, this is a virus that targets kids less than six months of age. The first few months of life, they get infected with this virus and they get terribly sick because they have, they can't breathe essentially. The virus gets down into the lungs and it causes swelling and breathing difficulty. So it's a real target for immunization. A, a vaccine was made in the 60s, uh, but it failed because it, it failed to induce a good innate response. Now, some of these subunit vaccines, we add an adjuvant to the vaccine to stimulate inflammation. It's a compound that has just been empirically determined when you inject it into animals. It stimulates inflammation. It gets cells, immune cells, innate immune cells into the area, your dendritic cells and macrophages. They make cytokines in response to the adjuvant, and that helps boost the immune response uh, to the subunit vaccine. So this is what happened with the respiratory uh, syncytial vaccine. So normally the virus, uh, of course, infects cells, but here I'm showing you the virus being sensed by a toll-like receptor, TLR4, which senses one of the viral uh, glycoproteins. Uh, and that, of course, uh, eventually gives rise to the innate immune response. It's not shown here. But down here, between transcription factor activation and antibody maturation, here you've got the interferon response and all those cytokines being produced that help make a good adaptive response. All right, so this is an important part of the natural infection to give you good immunity. The um, respiratory syncytial virus vaccine that failed was actually a formalin inactivated vaccine, did not did not engage TLR4 because the capsid, the, the glycoprotein was sufficiently changed that it wasn't recognized by TLR4. So the antibodies were low affinity antibodies produced to that vaccine. So we just figured this out in the last couple of years that to get a high affinity antibodies, you need a good innate response. And to do that, you have to stimulate through a toll like receptor. So, you know, this is not something we could have known in the 60s, we didn't even know about innate immunity in the 1960s or toll-like receptors, so it comes from doing uh, the research. So a couple of words about adjuvants. These are substances that we add to vaccines to make them have a better immune response. And these are typically chemicals of various sorts. Um, they, they stimulate inflammation. That's one of the ways that they work, and they help you get a better immune response. Remember, we talked a lot about how you need inflammation to get a good immune response. If the vaccine doesn't do that on its own, you add an adjuvant. And there are three ways that we think they work. Uh, one of them is by stimulating inflammation. Uh, we also think they present antigens as particles. They mix with the adjuvant and somehow look like a particle, and that's better for presentation. And they may also help to localize the antigen to the site of inoculation. So I once heard a, uh, an anti-vax person call adjuvants nothing more than hamburger helper. I don't know if you guys know what that is, but I have never used it, so. But it's something you buy in the supermarket and you add it to chopped meat to, so you can make more hamburgers, but it's not actually meat, okay? So you can take a little bit of meat and feed 20 people instead of two. And so it's called hamburger helper. So he said adjuvants are made and put in vaccines so the vaccine companies can make a lot of vaccine and give it to more people. And that's just wrong. Okay, they're not hamburger helper. They work in a very specific manner. And one of them is something you understand, making inflammation so we get good antibody responses. Now, fortunately, people don't like adjuvants. They do tend to give you more side effects. When you get injected with them, your arm hurts. You may get a fever. Getting inflammation, that's good, right? Inflammation is good for an immune response. So we only have a couple. We have the hepatitis B vaccine, has aluminum salts as an adjuvant, and the uh, human papillomavirus vaccines. They both have uh, adjuvants of various sorts. I'm only showing you one here, but there are actually two of them. A couple of sub, uh, subunit vaccines that work really well. The hepatitis B virus vaccine is the glycoprotein of the virus. So here's the virion here. Just to refresh your memories, remember that gap double-stranded DNA, the weird one. So that's encased in a capsid, which in turn is enveloped. And then there's a glycoprotein in the virion. It's called the hepatitis B virus surface antigen. 
and you take the gene encoding that glycoprotein, you express it in yeast, and you get uh, virus-like particles. You don't have the genome in them, you just have um, a particle with the glycoproteins assembling, and that's very uh, immunogenic and protective. Uh, the other really a good one and important one is the human, human papillomavirus vaccines, which are used to protect against uh, anogenital cancers in both men and women. And there are two kinds. There's Gardasil made by Merck, which is four different high-risk serotypes of uh, the virus, which are associated with cancers. And then there's Cervarix by GlaxoSmithKline, which is just types 16 and 18. Uh, this, the, the Gardasil is made in yeast, and the uh, Cervarix is made in insect cells. They both have adjuvants in them. And what you do is you take the gene encoding of the L1 major capsid protein, and you express it in either insect cells or in yeast. And they assemble into virus-like particles. Remember, the capsid proteins have all the information to interact with each other. Way back in the structure lecture, we learned that. So if you just express this protein, even in an insect cell or a, a yeast, totally different environment, it will fold properly. It makes a capsid. You get these empty capsids where virus-like particles, um, which are very immunogenic, but you still have to use a, uh, an adjuvant. You get injected in your arm with these three, uh, three shots, and you get very good antibody protection against uh, this cancer-causing vaccine. And in one of my podcasts, we talked with Michelle Osborne, uh, uh, who uh, works on this virus and, and talked a lot about this vaccine. So I want to give you a couple of examples of some new technologies that are coming along in the vaccine world, because all the vaccines that we use mainly today, with a few exceptions, are pretty old school, and they'll be gone. And maybe uh, by the time some of you are physicians, they'll be gone and replaced by others. So, you know, someday you may give a patient a virus-like particle vaccine made in plants, and the patient will say, what is this? And you should be able to answer exactly what it is, and if you've taken this course, you will know. You say, I remember Racaniello telling me about that, and here's a link to the lecture if you want to go listen to it. <laughs> uh, one really cool example, which is in clinical trial, is a virus-like particle made for influenza by expressing the hemagglutinin and protein alone in plant cells. Just do the HA alone, and it causes budding and the formation of empty particles with HA in it. And these are immunogenic. They're in clinical trial already. The reason they use tobacco is because you can genetically manipulate tobacco very easily. You can put genes in it and express it. This is pretty cheap. This is what the virus particle, like particle looks, by the way. A square meter of plants, of tobacco plants, makes 20,000 doses of vaccine at uh, less than 20 cents a dose. So this is pretty... This is pretty cheap, and it's quick to do. You just need the sequence of the HA. And so, for example, if you have a new pandemic strain of flu emerging, right, say on day zero here on this graph, you um, identify a pandemic strain, it takes you six months to get an egg-based vaccine because you got to get the virus, you have to sequence the HA, you have to make reassortants, and then grow it up, test it. But if you get the pandemic strain, you have the sequence right away, you could be making a plant virus vaccine, that's the green curve right here, uh, before the first uh, pandemic wave. So the plant virus vaccine, in theory, could be available before the pandemic wave. In 2009, we had a new pandemic strain emerge in April, uh, and there was an initial wave, and then the egg-based supply kicked in later, so it had no effect on the initial wave. So there's a need to get some uh, quick-moving technologies. Now here's an example of another cool technology I want to tell you about. And these are these microneedle skin patches. All right, so these are just small pieces of plastic. This is someone's uh, finger here, to give you an idea of the size. And there are very tiny needles in it. What you do is you saturate this with vaccine, and then you press it into the skin and put a Band-Aid on it. Pretty low tech. The needles puncture the skin. They deliver the vaccine intradermally, which is a good place to put vaccines. Lots of dendritic cells in there. And in animal models, these are very immunogenic. So uh, I think this is going to be explored for a number of vaccines. It's good for developing countries. You just put it on uh, with a, uh, a Band-Aid. All right, let's talk about live attenuated vaccines, the live in quotes, uh, because they are not live. You take a virus, you make a vaccine that doesn't cause disease. So with these vaccines, you get replication when you take the vaccine. Uh, you get virions produced. Sometimes they're limited to the site of replication, sometimes they spread. You get 
mild or inapparent disease and you get protection. So the idea is, you know, if you have an inactivated virus vaccine uh, and we're looking at doses versus immune response, you need a couple of doses to get a good antibody boost depending on the type of vaccine. Uh, but a, an infectious virus vaccine, you infect and then the virus is amplifying itself. It's infectious, it's replicating in you. It mimics a natural infection, so you, good a, you get a good uh, antibody response. And in principle, the way you do this, the way it's been done so far, is you take your virulent virus and then you just try growing it in different kinds of cells to enrich for a population that no longer grows well in, in people. And you can use monkey cells, for example, and you just pass it from cell to cell, you're hopefully selecting for variants, and then you test the vaccine at each step. So this is in general what you would do. And so Albert Sabin did this. Um, sorry, I'm gonna talk about flu mist first. Uh, flu mist is a live attenuated trivalent nasally administered flu vaccine, which is basically uh, fills this bill. And it is a vaccine that is sprayed into your nose, okay? And, and it replicates in your upper respiratory tract. It has the same strains as the uh, injected vaccine that I told you about. In fact, these are egg-grown viruses. And they are also reassortants, but they are reassortants of a donor strain, which was developed by passing the virus at low temperatures in chicken kidney cells, okay? So this selected for an attenuated virus. Uh, and furthermore, the viruses are cold adapted that means they like low temperatures. So our upper tract is lower temperature than our lower tract. They're temperature sensitive, so they don't like to grow in our lower tract, and they're attenuated. They have other mutations that make them not cause disease in animal models. So the consequence of this is when you spray it in your nose, it's, res it's restricted to your upper tract. It never gets down into your lower tract, and you get a good immunity without getting uh, influenza. It's, and that restriction to the upper tract is a consequence of these nice uh, properties. So I think this is the best flu vaccine because it mimics a natural infection as compared to the inactivated one which is disrupted by chemicals and has no bearing to the original virus in terms of uh, physical appearances. So if you have a choice, you should take that one, I think. Um, unfortunately, the only one company that makes it at the moment, it's Metamune, they own the patent on it and so they don't want to license it to anyone, so the number of doses are pretty small. But when it goes off patent, then a lot of companies will presumably make it. And this is the, I think that's the vaccine of choice. So let's turn now to polio for, for the rest of the discussion. I want to talk about uh, the attenuated polio vaccines and how they're being used to, to eradicate uh, the disease, which is a really interesting story. Now remember, we left this last with IPV, Jonas Salk's IPV. He had this inactivated vaccine that brought polio down to, I don't know, about 2,000 cases a year in the U.S. by 1960. But a lot of people felt he, that you could never get rid of polio with this vaccine. You had to use a natural infection mimicking vaccine. So in the 50s, there were studies done by a number of investigators which showed if you took polio and passed it in cell culture, you could attenuate its virulence, that is, just pass polio in different cells, you take the virus you get, put it in animals, doesn't paralyze them. So it's an empirical development of strains. So Albert Sabin did that, and he made three strains of what we now call OPV, oral poliovirus vaccine, which were licensed in the U.S. in 1961, and they replaced Salk's IPV. So the way Salk, uh, sorry, Sabin did this, I should not compare confused Salk and Sabin because, in fact, during their careers, the two of them hated each other. Um, they thought the other person's vaccine was useless and would never work. And they, at conferences, they used to argue all the time. Uh, however, as you will soon see, we have now switched back to uh, Salk's vaccine in the U.S. Fortunately, both men are no longer here to gloat or to, to argue about it. So this is how Sabin made his three vaccine strains. Remember, there are three serotypes of polio. You have to immunize against all three to prevent disease. So he started with virulent strains, type one, two, and three, and he began passing them in monkeys, in monkey kidney cells, plaque purifications, you see, different for each one. The idea being if you can pass it in a heterologous host, maybe it loses virulence for humans. And every now and then he would take a sample of what he had and put it in monkeys. That was his animal of choice to measure virulence. He would inject the virus right into the brain or spinal cord and see if it paralyzed the monkeys. And eventually, he made three strains, 
which when injected right into the spinal cord, which is actually the most sensitive part for this assay, put it right into the spinal cord of monkeys, nothing happens, the monkeys are fine. And he took those three strains, and this is 1950 something, and the first thing you do back then when you develop a vaccine is give it to your family. So he gave it to himself and his daughters and his wife, and they were fine. So then he started giving it to bigger and bigger numbers of people. And he accumulated a, some data showing that it was immunogenic, but the US wasn't interested. They had the Salk vaccine. So Sabin had a friend in the Soviet Union who happened to be the director of uh, virology there. And he called him up and he, he went over with his vaccines and then the Soviet Union put it into 100 million people. And Sabin came back with these data and the US had to acknowledge it. And that's, that was how the vaccine was licensed. So this was licensed in 1961 in the US. And for many years, we didn't know how it worked. Because in 61, there was no, there was no sequencing of DNA. But uh, shortly after I entered the, the polio field, we, we began to be able to sequence these genomes. And so in my lab and a bunch of others, we sequenced the vaccine strains and compared them to the viruses that Sabin had started with to see how they were different. And this is how they're different. These are the three serotypes. And you can see the mutations are very few. In fact, two of the three strains have only two mutations that make them attenuated. That is, make them not cause paralysis. And I always like to tell people that if you went to the FDA today with a vaccine with two base changes from the virulent form, that you would never get your vaccine passed. But of course, Albert Sabin worked in a day when we didn't have sequencing. These changes, well, they're all over the genome. Let's go back. You can see they're in 5' UTR and also in capsid proteins, but the most important ones are in the 5' untranslated region, which you may remember in this viral genome is part of an IRIS, internal ribosome entry site. And here are the three serotypes of OPV and the single base changes. These single base changes in a non-coding region have an amazing effect. We've talked about this before. They are responsible for reducing uh, the neurovirulence of this vaccine. So the way the vaccine works is you, you drink it. Uh, you are actually drinking cell culture uh, material. Um, it goes into your intestinal tract. It replicates just as polio would, gets into your blood, sets up a viremia, and then you get a nice immune response. But it doesn't get into your CNS. It's probably delayed sufficiently in replication so that your innate immune response is keeping it peripherally located and preventing CNS infection. So that vaccine was introduced in the U.S. in 1960, and it ended up eradicating polio in the U.S., as you'll see in a moment. Now, because you, the virus replicates in your gut, it gives you gut immunity. So you, if you are then challenged with uh, a wild virus, it's not going to replicate in your gut, as it would if you had been immunized with IPV. Now, unfortunately, the, this vaccine can cause polio, and this is called vaccine-associated polio. It was recognized very early on when Sabin was doing his trials, if he would feed an animal these vaccines, they would excrete something that was more virulent. So back then we didn't understand the basis of that, um, but it will become clear in a moment. In the 1960s, when the vaccine was starting to be used in Europe, there were cases of paralysis uh, associated with immunization. And then in the US, as we got rid of polio, the only cases of polio uh, were vaccine-associated polio. And so we call this VAP vaccine associated paralytic polio. In the US, there are about seven to eight per year or one in 1.4 million doses. So that was the only polio in the US. So this was no longer acceptable. So we switched back to the IPV in 2000. Uh, by that time, both Salk and Sabin had died. So as I said, there was no gloating involved. So here are the cases of paralytic disease in the US from 61 to 2003. And you can see in the 60s quite a bit of total polio here, dropping rapidly after the indu introduction of uh, Sabin's vaccine. But now in 1961, you start to have vaccine-associated polio, which are these bars. And as wild polio was eliminated, you can see uh, the only polio in the US was vaccine-associated. The last case of wild polio in the US was in 1979 in an unvaccinated Amish community in Pennsylvania. And after that, every case in the US was vaccine associated. So in other words, you give a baby at one month of age polio vaccine, and that baby or the parents of the baby acquire uh, paralytic disease from the vaccine. So in, in 2000, we switched to IPV, and now there's no more 
vaccine-associated polio in the U.S. Why does it cause polio? Well, because when you ingest the vaccine, it replicates in your gut, and it reverts as it does that. And this was one of the first experiments done in 1985 that showed that. As a Pocorna virologist in the UK, Phil Miner, and he had a baby, and he decided he would take every one of his baby's diapers to work after the baby had gotten polio vaccine, and at work he would scrape out the poop and sequence it for the vaccine strain. And so he did this for a long time, and these are the some of the samples from his son David. And uh, you can see that we're looking at the type 3 strain just here. David gets a vaccine that has a U at 472, and this is the way it should be. That's an attenuated strain. But within uh, 35 hours, he's already excreting viruses with a mixture of U and C at this position. And C is the base that makes the virus virulent. And eventually, two days, David is excreting fully virulent virus. If you take this virus that David excretes and inject it into monkeys, it paralyzes them. And then Philip had a daughter. A couple of years later, he did the same experiment with her. Exactly the same results. And this happens in everyone, uh, not just in Phil Miner's kids in the UK. Everyone who gets the oral vaccine, the, vac the vaccine re reverts in your gut, and you shed virulent viruses. So one in 1.4 million people somehow are paralyzed by that. We don't know why, but the rest of us are fine. My theory is that the one in 1.4 million have some innate immune mutation that allows the virus to get into the CNS, but that's not something that's ever been uh, tested. So we're, we're in the process of trying to eradicate polio, which brings up this interesting question, can you eradicate a viral disease? And there are two requirements for that. You have to have uh, replication only in one host, and you have to have lifelong immunity uh, induced by, replication, by vaccination. So far, we've only uh, eradicated smallpox. That was in 19... Uh, 79, and parenthetically, there are two stocks of the virus remaining, supposedly, but there might be more. So there's a lot of debate on whether to destroy this or not. The WHO in 1988 passed a resolution to eradicate polio and stop immunizing by 2005-2010. Uh, and this was based on the fact that there's only one host for polio, humans, no other animals infected and immunization confers lifetime uh, immunity. So how are we doing here? Well, the problem is that polio vaccine can revert to cause polio, whereas smallpox vaccine never could. And so as long as you use OPV, which is the vaccine used by WHO in the eradication program, you're always going to have vaccine-associated polio. So WHO said, all right, sometime we're going to eradicate the virus, then we're going to stop immunizing at some point, because we can't keep putting this, uh, this virus out there that causes polio. And they said, well, there's no evidence that polio vaccine-derived strains circulate and cause disease in people, so this will probably be okay. But it turns out that uh, it's not okay. So in 1988, there were about uh, 350,000 global cases of polio in many countries. Ten years later, it was reduced to uh, uh, these countries shown in red. And now last year, uh, polio circulating in only four countries, Nigeria, uh, sorry, three countries, Nigeria, Afghanistan, and Pakistan. There was some spread from Nigeria to neighboring countries. And last year, 2012, there were only 222 cases of polio. So this is really good. And in particular, India is polio free for over one year, which is really amazing. It used to have the highest uh, global burden of polio. So I think eventually this can be achieved, maybe in the next 10 years or so. It's not going to be easy because there's lots of conflict in, in a lot of these areas that prevents uh, immunization from happening. But you can't use OPV. There have been outbreaks now caused by OPV in, in a couple of countries, shown here. In particular, uh, Haiti in, in 2001, I think, or maybe later, they had stopped immunizing because polio had been eradicated from the Western Hemisphere. And there was an outbreak of about 20 cases of polio in a remote village, and those were all vaccine-derived strains. They had come from a vaccine circulating for a couple of years. And there have now been a number of such outbreaks which show that uh, these strains can persist and, and be virulent. In particular, there are immunocompromised individuals who lack B cells, and you don't know that they have this, this disease at birth. You give them polio vaccine, and then it persists in them forever. It doesn't cause any illness, but they shed virus for 10, 20, 30 years. So these people are a threat in a, in a post-eradication era. 
So now we have this interesting conundrum that we have almost eradicated a disease with the vaccine, but we have to switch the vaccine because it's causing the remaining disease, or, or presumably will once there's no more polio. So you can't just stop immunizing. We know already from these outbreaks in Haiti and so forth that if you stop immunizing, you're going to get outbreaks of circulating vaccine-derived viruses. So you can't stop vaccinating. So now WHO has realize this and they're going to switch to IPV eventually for global eradication. Now this is a problem because you have to inject it, it's more expensive, etc. But um, you have to vaccinate now against the vaccine. So after you eradicate with OPV, you switch to another vaccine, maybe IPV. And as I said, this is more expensive and we don't know if it's going to work everywhere, but you use that until you no longer find circulating vaccine uh, derived strains in the environment. And then, and only then, can you stop immunizing. And you have to be really sure that there are no more vaccine-derived strains circulating. You have to test lots of the environment for that, and probably it's going to require 10 or 20 years of, of doing this. Now, in my view, IPV is probably not the ideal vaccine to keep using, and I'm hoping that people will come up with new versions, like uh, skin patch vaccines, which don't have to be injected. IPV is actually grown in the lab, in production labs, from virulent strains. So in a post-eradication era, that's going to have to be done in a BSL-4 production facility, which I just can't imagine. Having been in a BSL-4 suit, I can't imagine making thousands and thousands of liters of vaccine in such a facility. So I think we're going to have to develop a, a new vaccine, and the Gates Foundation, to its credit, is really uh, helping push that forward. So we have to keep stockpiling vaccines after eradication, even when we stop immunizing, because there's going to be plenty of sources of vaccine around, a virus around. My lab has polio, but I'll, I'll be able to get rid of it all. But it's going to be present in many other labs. And in the end, you can always synthesize the genome from the DNA sequence, which is in GenBank. And anyone could take that. It's 7,400 bases long, put it together, and, and make a virus. And so as I said, in, the, in this uh, post-eradication, post-immunization era, which vaccine are you going to use? I don't think OPV or IPV are the ones. I think it's going to be something new that we, that we don't even know about today. So here we are. We've spent billions of dollars in a, in a campaign which I think will work in maybe 10 years to eradicate polio, but you'll never really eradicate it because the sequence is always going to be there. And even smallpox, which is much, much longer, over 200,000 nucleotides long, you have the sequence and you can make virus from it. So, you can never really eradicate a virus because of that. <laughs>